gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, and abounding in steadfast love. The Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the 8th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. And Jesus began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. And he said this plainly. And Peter took him and began to rebuke him, but turning and seeing his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are not on the side of God but of men. And he called to him the multitude with his disciples and said to them, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his life? For what can a man give in return for his life? For whoever is ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him will the Son of Man also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Please be seated. Let's pray. Hold the cross before us, Lord. Help us to see it. Help us to see it for what it is. An instrument of suffering and death. An instrument of cruelty and heartlessness. But also the place where salvation was won. Where sin, death, and the power of the devil was defeated. Where the hope of all of humankind of all the world, began. Keep the cross in front of us, not only during the season of Lent, but throughout the year, so that we might remember that it is by the dying and the rising of Jesus that we live. Now gather us around your word, help us to hear it, and in hearing it, help us to live. We ask and pray these things in your name. Amen. Good friends, grace and peace to you today from God our Father, through our risen Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. The Civil War historian Shelby Foote, in an interview, was making some observations about the Civil War. And the first one he made was that the South never had a chance. They didn't have the manpower. They didn't have the industrial might. They didn't have the resources to win the war. The North, he said, fought the entire Civil War with one hand tied behind its back. They could have brought the other one out at any time, and the South simply would not have been able to pers persist. Of course, no one told the South that when the war began. And they, out of deep conviction, believed that they could indeed win the war and win their independence from the Union. And for the first two years, the Civil War went terrible for the North. Poorly trained armies, incompetent generals, politicians meddling meant disaster after disaster for the Northern armies. And the Southern armies were beginning to look like they were invincible. And even European governments were beginning to take notice and conversations in the palaces and the halls of Europe were that perhaps this confederacy might actually become a nation. And as things continued to go badly for the north, they began to grow within the northern states a movement that was saying, you know, this war is a waste of money, it's a waste of resources, it's killing all of our young men. We need to get out of it. And so by late 862 and early 1863, a movement was growing in the North called the Copperhead Movement of people who were opposed to the war. 
And they were not only opposed to the war, but they were making speeches and holding meetings and planning what they could do to derail the northern war effort so that the South could win the war and the North would have to sue for peace. And they spoke of all kinds of plans and disruptions they were going to do if they had but the good leadership to do it. And of course, the Southern President, Jefferson Davis, got wind of that, and he said, I can help you. He took some of his most able and gifted veterans of combat in the Southern Army, and he sent them north to all the Copperhead groups that were growing around in the Midwest and other parts of the North, to help them do what they said they wanted to do, to disrupt the North and bring about the end of the war. And these hard-bitten Southern veterans began meeting with these Copperhead groups, and they began detailing the plans that they had for carrying out their mission of creating instability and violence in the North so that the Northern government would give up the war. And initially there was enthusiasm by these northern copperheads that they were going to get something done. Until the southern veterans said, do you have any guns? And they said, why do you want guns? Because we're going to disrupt the north and we're going to start shooting. Uh, but people get killed when you use guns. Yes, people get killed we might get killed. Yes, you might get killed. When it became real, all of a sudden the Copperheads began to lose interest in their plans. And all their brave speeches and glorious things that they were going to do to bring about the end of the war became less important than sleeping safely in their bed at night and not worrying about whether or not they would die on a battlefield. And the movement died. Because they began to understand what the real cost of what they were saying they wanted to do would be for them. It's always very easy when somebody else is paying the price. Always is. Until you're asked to pay the price, and then you begin to wonder whether or not the price is worth it. Jesus has just told his disciples that he's going to Jerusalem to be killed by the chief priests and the scribes and the Pharisees. He also told them that after three days he's going to rise, and for whatever reason the disciples simply didn't understand what he was telling them, and Peter says, no, that's not going to happen to you, Jesus. We're not going to let that happen. Peter would later say, that if you're going to Jerusalem, Jesus, I'm going to go with you, and if need be, I'll die with you in Jerusalem. Of course, we know how that worked out for Peter. Little slave girl says, aren't you one of his disciples? And Peter says, don't, don't know the man. Never met him. Jesus begins teaching his disciples what it means to go to Jerusalem in our gospel lesson today. I want you to pay attention to something that he did as he began to teach his disciples. Verse 34, And Jesus called to him the multitude with his disciples and said to them. He didn't just call his disciples to teach them what's going to come. He called the multitude. That's us, folks. It isn't just the disciples he's going to talk to. If any of you want to follow me, you have to take up your cross and follow me. Let's think about that for a minute. If you want to follow me, you have to take up your cross and follow me. Well, the cross that Jesus is talking about is not the very nice, ornate wooden cross you have hanging on the wall in your home or the one you're wearing around your neck or the one that you might have in your bumper sticker. Jesus is talking about the cross upon which people are crucified. If you're going to follow me, says Jesus, there's a very real possibility that you're going to have to pay the price of following me. 
That gets real. All of a sudden, following Jesus just isn't giving up an hour on Sunday morning to go to church. Following Jesus becomes a matter of life and death. My life and death. Not somebody else's life and death, mine. But if you remember from catechism, from confirmation, when you were studying about holy baptism, Luther writes that we are to die to ourselves every day so that the new creation can be raised to follow Jesus. Following Jesus is always about dying and rising. It always has been. We have to die to ourselves first. That is to say, whatever we think is important, whatever things we want to be gods in our lives, even if it's our own self and ambition, that has to die. Because as long as that's alive in my life, I'm not going to follow Jesus. I might say I'm following Jesus, but the evidence of my life is not going to reflect that. That sinful nature, that desire to be my own God has to die. And then, and only then, can I begin to follow the Lord. And so, yes, I have to pick up my cross, and there, myself is crucified. So that I die to myself, and am alive to Christ. That's what it is to be a Christian. That's what it means to follow Jesus. Now, for many of the early Christians, that was a genuine Reality. The cross, for many of them, was a real thing. Because for a lot of them, that's where their lives ended. For other Christians, following Jesus meant having to decide whether they confess Jesus as Lord or Caesar as Lord. And if they would not confess Caesar as Lord, it meant death in the arena. Or any other number of ways in which the empire would devise a physical death for them. They understood that picking up their cross and following Jesus genuinely meant dying for the Lord. Now it's highly unlikely that we here in northeast Iowa in 2021 are going to have to face that kind of persecution. Not saying that it couldn't happen, but pretty unlikely. But there are other types of persecution that we come under that we all too easily give into. In American culture right now, we're perfectly fine with religion as long as you don't do anything about it publicly. You can have all the private religion you want as long as you don't act like a Christian out there in the real world because we're not comfortable with people living out their faith. And a person who seeks to live out their faith at best gets people looking at them kind of sideways and at worst saying, he's gone off the edge, he's a religious nut. That's a form of persecution. It's an attempt to silence you in your face so that you don't live your faith for others to see. That's a cross. And if we're going to follow Jesus, we have to make the decision between everybody else's approval or faithful witness to Jesus Christ. And there are other ways in which the culture around us persecutes and seeks to silence the voice and the witness of Christians. You're aware of them in your own life. And that's where Luther again is clear that each and every day my old self must die so the new self can rise. The old self asks, how can I get myself through the day? The new self asks, Lord, what can I do for you today? Regardless of the cost, Jesus, what can I do for you today? How do you want to use me today? How can my life be lived so that it is a reflection of your love and mercy, not only for me, but for the whole world? Jesus, what do you want of me today? That's picking up your cross. That's following the Savior. And that's going to be different for each and every one of you. Because the Lord has called each and every one of us to some type of particular service within his kingdom, and it's not going to be all the same. 
As I've said many times before, your service to the Lord might be spending your life caring for a neighbor who doesn't have any help or relatives around them, and you simply are there for them to provide the things that they need, to give them the love of Jesus by a warm meal and some friendship. You might be the one who's called upon to visit with that broken-hearted person who's lost a loved one but can't begin to talk to anybody about it because they don't know how to do that. And because you've experienced something similar, you can hear the pain in what they're saying. And so that might be how you're called to follow the Lord. That's the cross of reliving the pain that you went through so that they can understand that they aren't alone. And on and on it goes. But we are called to follow Jesus. We are called to pick up our cross and follow him. We are called to die to ourselves so that we can live in him. And really, that's what it comes down to in eternity as well. If all we want in this life is to live for ourselves, God will allow us to do that. But the very best we can hope then after death is that we get to spend eternity with ourselves. And I don't know if I want to do that. We're intended to spend eternity in the kingdom of God with our Heavenly Father, with our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and with all the saints who have gone before us. That is the end of our carrying our cross. At the gates of the kingdom, we lay down the cross and we take up the glory that is ours in Jesus Christ. But until then, the Lord bids us pick up the cross and follow him. And as Christians, we do that. Each and every day. Each and every day is another day in which I will take up the cross, die to myself, claim the promises made for me in my baptism, and go wherever Jesus directs. And continue to do that until the day I can lay it down for the last time. And then finally be in the kingdom where the cross is no more where sin and death and sorrow and suffering is no more, where all the things done in his name will have their completion and there will only be the glory and the love and the mercy of God the Father. So yes, take up your cross. Follow the Lord wherever he leads and keep doing it until the day he returns. Amen.